This presentation is on dehorning and branding, the animal welfare and beef quality considerations, and it's by John Campbell from the Western College of Veterinary Medicine. I am a professor at the vet school in Saskatoon. I work in the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences, and uh, I'm a beef cattle clinician on the ambulatory practice there, and most of my research is in beef cattle production medicine. This presentation focuses on the results of the National Beef Quality Audit and it was first undertaken in 1995 and this latest audit, 2010-2011, is the third to be completed. It measures quality defects in the slaughter plant and the audit focuses on those issues that can be managed by producers. This presentation is going to focus primarily on the issues around dehorning and branding. So let's start by looking at horns and dehorning. Well, it's not news to producers that we would take horns off cattle to decrease the risk of injuries to workers and other animals. But we can also uh, have an effect by minimizing the economic losses that happens at the slaughter plant uh, due to carcass bruising if horns are still present at that stage. Horns also create extra labor in the packing plant as they have to be removed for worker safety and, and can cost extra money because of that. Well, the easiest solution to horns is pulled cattle, and the proportion of beef cattle with horns has been steadily decreasing throughout these beef quality audits. We have more availability and adoption of polled or hornless genetics uh, throughout the industry, and most of the common beef breeds have polled lines available. This obviously eliminates the need for dehorning and is the easiest way to uh, take horns off cattle and certainly the most welfare friendly way. Here are the results from the 2010-2011 beef quality audit. Close to 90% of the fed cattle and 90% of the non-fed cattle were polled. Less than 3% of cattle had full horns. This percentage of polled cattle has been steadily increasing and you can see that it's about 20% higher compared to the 1999 audit. This table just breaks down the whole the horns that are seen, uh, you can see that the polled category close to 90% in both the fed and non-fed cattle categories. And then as you go down here, increasing sizes of horns from less than 2 inch or a skur to 2 to 4 inches is a stub, 4 inches is a tip, and then a full horn down here. And less than 3% of the fed cattle had full horns. Well, what does this mean in the packing plant? Well, it looks like we're doing a pretty good job of decreasing the incidence of horns. It's been steadily decreasing over the years and we're 20% lower than 1999. However, this still costs the industry significant money, $192,000 and change in 2011, which translates to about six cents a head. It's important to realize that this six cents a head is over all the animals that come into the packing plant, not just those with horns. This is actually an increase in costs over the 1999 audit due to the increases in labor costs that have incurred over that time. We have done a good job of decreasing horns, but it's still costing us slightly more because labor costs have gone up. It's important to understand that dehorning is a certainly an important welfare consideration, and as the public gets more concerned about how we raise our food, uh, this is one of the areas that they uh, are concerned about and dehorning is a painful procedure at any age. Ideally the best way would be to minimize horns by the use of pulled genetics. But if we do need to dehorn the first rule of thumb should be to do it as early as practically possible at as young an age. There's really two separate ways of dehorning. The first is called disbudding. The horn bud actually attaches to the skull of the calf at somewhere around two to three months of age. Disbudding actually refers to the removal of the horn bud prior to this attachment occurring to the skull. This can be done a number of ways. We can use caustic paste, we can use knives, or through the use of cautery with an electric or butane powered disbudding iron. Disbudding is definitely preferable to dehorning because there's less tissue damage and less pain at that earlier age prior to the attachment of the horn bud. This slide just shows some of the instruments that we use for dehorning. Wherever possible, we'd like to use the dehorning paste 
or these electric or butane powered debutters uh, in young cattle rather than resorting to some of the other instruments that cause more pain and tissue damage later in life. We actually have a couple of techniques we can use for pain control at dehorning. You should talk to your veterinarian about the use of pain control as an option when you're disbudding or dehorning your calves. We can actually use local anesthetic injected near the nerves of the horn to minimize the pain and struggling associated with this procedure. It's quite a simple procedure and your veterinarian can teach you how to do it. Or we can give analgesic injections that can be given to reduce the pain that occurs following the procedure. We have licensed products that are approved for this uh, and they're quite easy to give. The second part of this presentation is going to focus on the issues around branding in the beef quality audit. Branding still remains a necessary permanent form of identification for cattle in some parts of Canada. It's used specifically in open range situations or community pastures for identifying stolen or lost cattle and determining animal ownership. In some situations, financial institutions may even require branding as proof of ownership. We certainly have many other forms of identification available to us as well. All cattle in Canada when they leave the home farm are identified with a Canadian Cattle Identification Agency ear tag or a CCIA ear tag. These ear tags utilize radio frequency identification technology and are often used as a management tool if we have electronic readers. Most of our cattle would also have some sort of management tag as well that can be read visually with an identification number that can be seen from some distance so that the animal can be identified. In the beef quality audit, branding again has decreased in prevalence similar to dehorning significantly since the 1999 audit. In 1999, approximately 25% of the fed cattle had brands, and in the 2010-2011 audit, only 9.8% of the fed cattle had brands. Here's a breakdown of where the brands were located, approximately 60% on the hip, 37% on the rib, and just under 3% on the shoulder. This again breaks down the location of brands. This time it breaks it down by fed cattle and non-fed cattle. And of course, we see the prevalence of brands slightly higher in non-fed cattle, but again, a very low prevalence of brands uh, in the fed cattle compared to the 1999 audit. Well, where did the economic losses come from due to branding? Hides are actually a valuable commodity to the packing industry, and brands can significantly damage them. The estimate is that a total of $2.8 million was lost to the industry due to branding damage, which translates to 88 cents a head and we, when we put that uh, number out to all the cattle through the packing plants. This is a significant decrease from 1999, when the total losses to industry totaled closer to $15.8 million. So we've done a good job of decreasing the prevalence of brands. There are certainly welfare implications for branding. It's also a painful procedure and it causes short-term pain and stress to the animal by any method. We really don't have good practical techniques to provide local anesthesia for branding, although pain medications can be given post-branding just as we can do for dehorning. Producers can also minimize the impact of branding by using proper techniques. Some of the recommendations would be, first of all, to use other methods of identification whenever possible. When branding is necessary, use a single iron or a small brand to reduce pain. Shoulder or hip brands are preferable to rib brands, and face branding is currently not used in Canada and is illegal. This picture just shows someone using a freeze brand, which is a slightly more complicated technique, but has been shown to cause slightly less pain than, than uh, hot iron branding. We should train our staff to how to properly administer brands, either hot iron or freeze branding. Freeze branding may be slightly less painful, but it can only be used in dark colored breeds, and it actually is a more technically difficult procedure to do well. Make sure that we don't brand wet cattle where scalding may occur, and make sure you talk to your veterinarian about the possible uses of pain control medications at the time of branding. In conclusion, these have been both good news stories. 
producers have done a great job of reducing the incidence of horns and brands, and we've seen dramatic reductions in both the prevalence of these things since the last National Beef Quality Audit. We want to make sure this trend continues so that we can continue to minimize economic losses, and we can also continue to work to improve animal welfare in our industry.